Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be going an in-depth dive to the G3000. So if most of you probably remember a while ago we went ahead and made a little video on this, kind of showing off some of the different features and functionalities. Uh, there's been some changes to the system over time. Uh, obviously Microsoft has been releasing all sorts of uh, useful updates to try to make things a little bit more user-friendly and a little bit more close to uh, what they actually are in the actual airplane. And we're going to be taking a look at a few of those options today. So first things first, uh, we're in the TBM 930. Uh, we're sitting here in a very, 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 very far away from where I am in Entebbe. This is an airport basically in South Central Africa. So what we're going to be doing is we're going be showing you how all the different components work, uh, what the different displays mean, how to change some different settings, uh, kind of how to adjust things, and kind of make the best of the G3000's display. So first things first, uh, the G3000 is basically an update to the G1000, whereas the uh, G1000 was basically, you know, we need just a little bit of instrumentation. The G3000 completely replaces every instrument in the aircraft. We do have two backup instruments up at the top center here. You can see we have this handy dandy little HSI, or not HSI. We have a nice little attitude indicator if we need it, and plus we have our air speed tapes here, and you've got a little indicated altitude control here. So the G3000 is broken into multiple displays. So you have your PFD, which is your primary flight display here. You have your MFD, which is going to be providing us a multifunction display here. And you have your little control panel down here. Uh, whereas in the G1000, everything is done here in the bottom. In the G3000, uh, there's quite a bit of work that you actually do with this little screen down here. Note, if you're on the uh, large Cessna jet, you actually have a separate control panel that's actually located down here that you can do some different work with as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, uh, taking a look at this uh, particular control panel. Uh, when we did our G1000, this is where the other day, we concentrated on communications frequencies. It's a little different in this aircraft if you want to play with the radio. So normally, uh, you'd have these big knobs right here that you grab onto and crank, but um, that's not actually where our radio is controlled, nor that's where we're going to be getting our audio. Our audio panel on this aircraft is actually located down here on pressing this button. This is NAVCOM. We're going to find the soft key and go ahead and mangle it real quick. Now, when you first look at this, you go, oh my gosh, what have you done? Well, the good news is this is actually a good thing because they simplified a lot of our displays here. Basically, what you have here is we have the ability to go ahead and dial in the frequency we're going to be interested in. Let's say we want to go to 12300. Zero, zero. I can actually go ahead and press the enter key here to save it. Or if I wanted to, I could just press the transfer key and actually send it over to my new frequency. Wow, that's fast. Man, I would kill to have this on the old plane. I used to have to crank the radio by hand on. The other thing you can do, of course, is you can press right here and you can go ahead and switch between COM1's radio, which is going to be the first radio, and COM2, which is going to be the second radio. If I go ahead and press those buttons real quick, you can see it changes my selected value. And if I want to, I can actually press and hold and swap. You're not going to see this until I press and hold and swap. And that will go ahead and do the transfer for us as well. Or you can come down here and mash the transfer key. It does not make much of a difference. Now, to confuse things a little bit with the nav and comm on the G3000, is if you come down here, you see this thing that says mic 1. If you press that, it switches to mic 2. This is the radio you are transmitting on. If I mangle this a few times, you'll actually notice it points to the microphone, or I should say, what we're going to be talking on. It'll actually highlight it in the color green so you're aware of who you're talking to. Now, if I come down here and press mon, you'll notice this is the one that allows us to control who we're listening to. Right now, we're pointing on 1 and 2, which means we're actually listening to both these channels at the same time. So for example, if I wanted to go to the uh, Universal 121500, press transfer, I could be listening on the guard frequency at all times while also being able to just transmit on the first microphone. Now you're sitting there going, well, that's great and all, but um, what about the rest of them? But what, what, what if I want to do ADF? Oh, ah, ah. Don't panic. There's a button right here that says audio and radio. If you push that, it brings up all of the audio controls. Now, the way this works is pretty straightforward. Uh, you notice that there's this little gray line underneath each one of these options. We can surf through the different ones, by the way, by going this way. And you can go ahead and click on them to turn on the audio for them. Like, for example, if I click on this one real quick, I can actually go ahead and flip it this way. And you'll notice there's control of the volume individually right over here. So, you know, you can go ahead normally you'd be able to crank the volume up real quickly here you would even push that if you want to listen to its id and again everything would be controlled via that control there so go ahead and surf down here you know we have a little recorder if we want to record a message for our crowd we could come down here and we could turn on a marker beaker audio marker beacon audio as well if we wanted to we could even come down here and adjust the adf volume you know for a desire while with that you can also come down here and turn the clicks on and off and I'll kind of come down here obviously this is a little different because of the way that this particular one is configured but this is where you could turn on a little boop 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 noise uh, when you're actually operating. Now, one thing I do want to see is, let's say we want to change our ADF frequency. This is a very well buried. You actually can click on it and go ahead and now dial in whatever ADF you're going to be interested in for that particular operation that you're going to be traveling on. Now, where we are currently, uh, there's not really a lot of ADF stations at our disposal that we could really take a look at, but I believe there was one by, so I'm going to go ahead and say a zero. Tree, five, five, press the transfer button, and you can see it automatically snaps itself to the next ADF. 
Now, if I want it to come up here and I want to go ahead and set one of the nav frequencies, let's say I want to set nav two, I simply click on it just like that and I can go ahead and dial in uh, whatever VOR, whatever particular one I'm looking for. Let's say I want to do uh, 11750 and press transfer. And now I've gone ahead and set that up inside of my navigation to radio. So now I have the ability to go ahead and use that as a navigation reference should I need it a little later on. When I'm done with all this, of course, I can always press the back key to come back to this page. Or if you prefer, you can actually press the home button if that's what you need to do, or we can select another one of these options. Other thing you want to keep an eye out on this little navigation radio page is the transponder ident option. Now, if I press this button, we identify with our transponders. Now, in the event that we want to change your transponder frequency, we'd have to click on this button right here. If I press it, you'll notice you have your mode over here, standby on altitude, as well as the current frequency. So if I were in the United States and I were flying VFR, I could type in 1200, or I could even mash the VFR button, press enter, and whoosh, I've automatically adjusted that particular frequency. Now, if ATC asks us to ident, we just go boop and push the button, and now we are all set. So again, the auto panel is designed to make your life very, very simple, and it really does a great job of it. And I really, really appreciate the way that that has been simplified compared to, you know, especially when we we're working with a G1000 and everything's a thousand little knobs. I find visually this is a little difficult, but I got good news. Up at the top center, it does tell you your current communication frequency. And you'll notice, of course, um, unfortunately, even though I can change which microphone I'm on, it will not change the reference frequency up in the top corner, which is kind of a bummer because that would make our lives much, much simpler. So let's go ahead and take a look at other options we have at our disposal. I'm going to press the PFD. This is going to give us our control over the CDI, the bearings, the speed bugs, the timers, the minimums, and of course the fun settings, which we'll take a look at in a second. First one at the top is our navigation source. Uh, this is really critical. This is what's going to be driving our navigation display, especially if we're going to be using automatic pilot in order to get us to a specific destination. So if I come down here and press nav source nav one, you'll notice it selects whatever VOR station I have located in nav one. Keep in mind, if I'm doing an ILS approach with this aircraft, you would need to make sure that your ILS is loaded into nav one in and that the CDI is active as NAV1, in which case it would be LOC1 for localizer 1, so you could go ahead and safely land the aircraft. I'll switch this back over to GPS real fast. Also at your disposal are two bearing displays. What the bearings do is they're going to display bearing information both pointing where the particular object is, as well as giving you critical information about it. For example, if I set my bearings to navigation two, I notice that there's this little blue needle there that's pointing towards our nearest little VOR station, which is right over here over our left wing. And it also gives us the DME information down here on the left. Now what makes this so cool is there's actually multiple bearings. For example, I have my GPS bearing and I even have my ADF bearing. If I had a little bit more altitude, I'd actually be able to pick up this ADF station and the blue needle would actually point towards it if we wanted to go get a little old fashioned so to speak. So notice you have two different sets of bearings so there's nothing stopping you from making both bearings pointing towards the same thing. I don't know why you do it but you know you can do whatever you want it is your aircraft you decide. Below that, you have your speed bugs. Uh, your speed bugs are basically going to give you the ability to select uh, what speeds you want to go ahead and tell yourselves that you need to rotate at, that you climb at your best angle, climb at your best speed, or approach. To use these, super simple. You just simply boom, click on it, and now when I get up to speed, up to about 90 knots, you'll actually see a little VR with a little carrot to let me know that I've reached 90 knots. Now, if I want to shut that off, I can click that off. If I wanted to change it, which is super cool, I can actually come in here, click on it, and then set a different speed for the purpose. Let's say I want to say 120 knots. Press the enter key, and now my VY is going to display itself as 120 knots. Now, this being a TBM, um, it's not unusual to dial this value in for your climb speed of 150 knots, uh, just to keep your own sanity. Keep in mind, selecting your speed is going to be different than actually flying your speed, so I'll mind that one as well. Next option we have here is going to be timers. Uh, timers are wonderfully straightforward in this particular aircraft. Again, much simpler than the G1000. I simply click right here. If I want to do a starting time, I can go ahead and type it in. Let's say I want to do uh, 10 minutes. Just type in 10, press enter. And now I have a 10 minute timer. I can either count up or I can count down. And as soon as I want this timer to get started, I press the start. If I want to stop it, I can press stop. And of course, if I press reset, it is going to snap back to the value that we had actually set it to originally. Note that there is a timer display right here. Thank you so much for applying that. Now, if I press start, you can actually see your timer counting down right here. Uh, folks who are instrument pilots I'll love having timers because they can do something like this. So they know exactly when they have to do their missed approach. They have their two minute timer ready to go. Boop, they just push the button and they're on their way. Also at our disposal are our minimums. Now notice there are two different flavors of minimums on this particular aircraft. Uh, we have barometric as well as radio. Barometric just simply means we're gonna be using whatever air pressure is to determine our altitude. And radio, of course, is gonna be a radio altimeter. If I press this button, we can pick which one of the two we wanna use. In this case, let's pick barometric. Uh, the minimums for this particular airport would be a little bit, let's say uh, 3,900 feet. 
So type in 3900, press enter, and boop. Now I've got barometric minimums. Now if I wanted to use an MDA, I could go over here, set this to radio, and just dial in how many feet above ground level. I'd like it. And it'll display it nicely for you. And of course, when you're coming in for a landing, this thing will get all sorts of happy and beep at you. And notice, we also have a reading of our radar altimeter right now, which is about four feet because it's physically four feet over the ground. Last option we have on this page is the PFD settings. This is great. Uh, we have AOA, which gives us the ability to display this little knob here. If you're not a fan of staring at that the whole flight, you can just press the off button. If you switch it to automatic, theoretically, this should only be coming out when we're either at extreme AOAs or we have our landing gear down, but it works perfectly fine. You can leave it on, you can leave it off, completely up to you. Below that, we have the wind display. Uh, folks who have seen things that have done before, and notice that uh, you have option one, which is going to give you a combination of your crosswind. In this case, you have wind coming from your right, as well as your headwind, which is about six knots. You can switch it to option two, which is going to go ahead and tell you just the direction of the wind as well as its magnitude, which in this case is six knots right in our face. And of course, option three will give you a combination of the direction of the wind as well as the magnitude of the wind plus this little arrow. Very, very, very handy. Next option we have is this one. This is comm channel spacing. Now, you're probably sitting here saying, why would you need to fits with this? Well, the reality is you don't always need every minute little discrete frequency that you're going to be using when you're changing the channel. But obviously, if you're not using a knob to change the channel, this is not relevant. Otherwise, you could set this to 25 kilohertz, which spreads how much of a jump your needle would make when you're making frequency adjustments on the radio. Again, you can set this to whatever you feel appropriate. Last but not least, and I'm glad they added this function, is the ability to shut off the terrain. It's a great way to get a couple frames if you need it, or if you're simulating an older style of the G3000. Remember, this SVT terrain is tremendously expensive upgrade on this aircraft. So, of course, if you're already paying a million dollars for it, I'm sure the extra five grand is not really that painful. Again, you're going to roll out of the mortgage. Okay, so that's up for the PFD, and now we're going to take a look at the MFD. A couple different settings here. Uh, the first one is going to be map settings. Uh, this is, oh my gosh, I'm so glad they added this as an option. If I press this button now, I can set heading up, which uh, rotates my entire map, so where the plane is pointing is where we're going. You can also set this to track up, which is going to be where the aircraft is actually drifting. And of course, you can do north up for those people who, um, yeah, I have no idea what you guys are doing. What, what is this about? Again, always use the technique you want. I'm a fan of heading up, but again, pick what works best for you. On the right is our weather. Keep in mind, these are mutually exclusive. So if I go to weather selection, I can now turn on my weather radar. Remember, my weather radar only shows precipitation, does not show clouds. We have the horizontal mode, which is range can be adjusted by wheeling this little knob down here, holding my mouse over and wheeling the mouse. Or we can do vertical, which is going to give us above and beyond us. Again, I can adjust my range just by coming down here and tweaking this, and you can see that my range is changing as I'm rolling my mouse here. Obviously, it's only showing you precipitation. Obviously, the redder is going to be more aggressive precipitation, and obviously, no means no precipitation. If we want to get rid of this, by the way, we go back, we click on the map button to snap it back. Also notice under weather, you have the ability to select next rad, which is going to show you a satellite-based weather display here. Uh, if you don't want to see this, you can just click it and get rid of it. Otherwise, we can just go back to map and be completely done with that completely. These functions here, we're going to hold off to them for just a second. Below that, you can have an aircraft settings button. Oh, thank you so much for adding this. We now can adjust how bright everything is. Now, this is pretty straightforward. We simply press and hold, or if you ground to, you can grab this with your finger and you can finally tune your display's brightness down. I personally find them ridiculously bright by default. So I'm just this is about 65. And we'll do 70 just to make people at home happy. Press back, press back, or we can always press the MFD button. Below that, we have our speed bugs, which we've already taken a look at. Again, we took a look at those a minute ago. Now we have waypoint information. Now what this does is this allows us to dial in an airport, and it will go ahead and give us information about it. So for example, if I click on select airport, uh, we can go ahead and pick this one right there. That There's a hotel. Again, this is alphabetic corner. Uniform. Now we're going to do kilo, and we're going to say Juliet here. Press enter. And now it's going to give us information about this. Now, what I really love about this display is it gives you the frequencies if you need them. It also gives you information about the runways. In this case, we can see there's a 3,600 feet runway here. And normally what you could do in this display is you'd have information about VOR, ADF, all your waypoints would all be all listed in here. Fortunately, this version, we only have the waypoint info someday. Last but not least on this page, other than these three, which we're saving, is the nearest option, which gives us the ability to pick one of these options that is nearby. For example, if I want to pick the nearby NDB, I could press it, and it gives me a list of all the NDBs that are nearby. Um, obviously, if we want to pick, let's say, this one, Soroiti, I can actually make myself direct going to it, or I can insert it into my flight plan. Now, one of the things I really like about this is the fact that it gives us the ability to add this as we go, which, again, is tremendously helpful for our purposes. If I hit back, hit back one more time. And then, of course, we have our navcom page, which we've already taken a look at. 
So with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at our actual PFD here. You're going to notice there's a bunch of different options along the bottom here. And again, depending on what you're setting up trying to do here, it's going to change which one. First one is your map range. Keep in mind, this controls the map range of this map, the inset map, not the big map. If you want to adjust the big map, you want to go to MFD and you just want to go ahead and wheel this mouse right here so you can adjust that directly. Next item we have on it is PFD map settings. Notice this button does not work. Now you're sitting there going, no, it doesn't work. Um, yes, it does. You just have to go over to the other page for it. That's what this page is. So kind of keep that in mind that the page does exist. It's just down here instead of up here. Next one, you have your traffic inset. You can mash that button all afternoon and nothing's going to change on it, unfortunately. To the right of that, we have PFD settings. Now this is cool because this is basically a copy of this page down here. So the one over here, we have attitude overlays. Again, we can shut off that terrain if we don't want to look at that. We also have the ability to change the PFD mode. Now watch this. If you push this button, nothing happens. Normally what you could do is you could flip this mode so that it simplifies everything that you're looking at. We have our two bearing controls. Again, this is the same bearing controls that we had down here. You can select the name of the spot. And under other PFDs, of course, we have the ability to take a look at our other com communications frequencies. You can do your wind display. Altitude units would change this from feet to meters, but unfortunately that doesn't work. And of course, you have your AOA display uh, should you desire to play with that as well. Coming to the right of that, you have your OBS. If we press this magical button, nothing happens. It's a stress button. Relax. To the right of that, we have an active navigation, which lets you switch between your different modes. Make sure the mode agrees with what you're trying to use to navigate. To the right of that, we have sensors, which unfortunately we have no control over. These would be things like radar displays. We have the Wix radar controls, which again, if you want to play with those, you're going to be coming over here and mashing this button over here. But as you can see, these buttons are mostly for show for what we're going to be doing. And over here in the middle, you'll notice that we have all of our standby frequencies, we have our radio frequencies, we have all of our critical information as far as our waypoint, we have which display modes, we have our current zoom. Over here on the left, uh, we have all the critical information about the engine. Right now, we're not producing much torque, which makes sense. My throttle's backwards. Man, I've burnt a lot of fuel sitting here. Uh, we have RPM, our gas generator speed, in interstage turbine temperature. We have any warnings that we need down here. Cabin pressure, uh, we have how much oxygen we have on board, our fuel capacity, we have stuff for electricity. We have our flap settings. Everything is displayed on this middle display here. Unfortunately, none of the fun soft keys down here that give us the ability to do charts and maps are available at this time, which, you know, at some point, I'm sure we're going to get one of those. This one over here is a duplicate of that display. So now that you have a pretty good idea of what everything is, and again, if you've seen stuff about the G1000, you're probably mostly familiar with this one. What does everything else mean? So what we're going to do is go ahead and get this aircraft a nice and airborne, and we're going to take a look at those other options. But of course, uh, before we go airborne, it probably would be a good idea to set up a flight plan. So if we want to do flight plans, uh, simply go to the MFD page, and you have a couple different options. You have the direct to option, which allows you to establish a waypoint that you're going to point the plane right at. To use that is super duper simple. I'm simply going to press direct to. I'm going to click where it says select waypoint, and you're just going to dial in the waypoint that you're interested in. Now, for example, we want to go, let's say, just right over there. Let's say hotel, uniform, kilo, Juliet. As soon as I press enter. It'll go ahead and make sure this is the one we're looking for. And if we're happy with it, we just go boop and press activate. And you can see we get the magenta line of safety directly to our destination. We can also see since we have GPS selected underneath our active nav, it's going to take us right there. It's automatically updated our course for us and everything's looking pretty solid as far as that goes. Now, let's say we want a slightly more sophisticated flight plan. Now, those of you who know the G1000, notice you get this little knob. You have to go, ah, trying to crank on that thing to get it to behave the way that you want it to. Uh, we don't have to stress out. This is actually amazingly simple. We simply come down here. We press the flight plan button and what da da now we can just sit here and go nuts so for example i can come up here i can say oh we don't want that one i'm going to remove that waypoint make it go away I can come here i can move that waypoint and it'll completely reset everything by the way uh, because of the way flight simulator works i usually recommend people go out of that page if you start deleting things before you start going to town so let's go ahead and add up our origin position here we can come in here and type in hotel uniform echo november enter and now we can go ahead and select what our en route waypoints are as well as our destination. If you need to scroll, you can click and drag this thing, or you can press the up and down button here. So we're going to go ahead and add an en route waypoint. I'm going to click right here. And we're going to go ahead and add our first waypoint, which is going to be hunk. <laughs> How convenient, right? U, N, K, enter. So we have added another one. So now let's say we want to add up another one from there as well. We'll go ahead and add ourselves a destination. And our destination is going to be Huso. H, U, S, O, enter. 
Now, the important difference between an on route waypoint and a destination is a destination, if we click on it, will give us the ability to answer any special sort of approaches or anything along those lines. Also notice we have the ability to go to direct to any waypoint just by clicking this button or actually moving the waypoint around should we need to do so. We can also activate the leg of a waypoint. The leg of the waypoint, if I zoom out just a teeny tiny bit so you can see this, go to PFD, go ahead and zoom out so you can see it. It's a bit of a ride here. For example, if I want to activate this leg here, I could select that directly. Simply go to the one that you want. I'm going to go ahead and click this one. Activate leg to waypoint, and that's going to go ahead and activate the leg that's going to take me between those two points directly on the, along this flight. And you can see my GPS system instantaneously updated to represent that teeny tiny little change that it just made. Uh, the great thing, of course, with flight plans is that we have the ability to save them, but not on this particular version, which is a kind of a shame here. And at any time, like I mentioned, we can select something we want to, and we could go ahead and move these waypoints around. Press back, we got our flight plan, everything is looking good. You can see the current one that I have selected. Again, we can move our way up and down these should we need to. We can delete them, we can do everything we need to like those lines. Now, the cool thing with flight plans is we also have the ability to select procedures. Now, if I press the proc button and I press departure, we can actually pick our departure procedure here. We can load it directly in should we need to. We can select an arrival procedure. There are no arrival procedures at Huso, or we can even come in here and select our approach. So in this case, my approach is going to be, um, we're going to do a VOR approach, NDB sounds like fun. We can select our transition, and as soon as we're ready, we can just hit load. And what that will do is actually add it to the end of our waypoint here, right before our final waypoint, as you can see that it has listed now. Again, this is an amazingly sophisticated system. I'm actually going to go over to MFD and go to flight plan. We're going to see who's selected right now. Uh, we're going to go ahead and select that one. I'll go ahead and set activate leg. And that's going to get us going nice and smoothly to uh, over here between user where we started and hunk, which is going to be our destination. All right, let's go ahead and get this thing air and then we'll take a look at some of the other pages that we have at our disposal on this particular device. All right, we are on our way up, uh, heading towards our destination. The GPS has all been pre-programmed. You can see again, a beautiful, 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 beautiful south side of Africa here. And imagine just <laughs> so much lovely wildlife going around this. So we've got ourselves climbing. The automatic pilots are doing all the hard work for us here so we can take a look at the other parts of our display. So right here in this part of the G1000, or G3000, I should say, we have everything basically that you're probably familiar with in any glass cockpit. Over here on our left is going to be our speed tape. This is going to tell us what our indicated airspeed is. Below that, that's going to get us our true airspeed. And of course, if we're interested in ground speed, uh, that's going to be listed over here. I have a pretty solid video that explains the differences between those three for those of you who are interested. Underneath that, of course, you have, like I said, true airspeed, our angle of attack. Obviously, if this needle is pointing to the red zone, um, you probably got the nose up too high and you're probably going too slow. You're being too aggressive in a turn. At the very top is going to be our selected climb airspeed. In this case, I've selected 200 knots for a climb. That's it's a very fast climb, but remember this is a fast aircraft. Above this in the center is any of our current modes. Remember white means it's armed, green means it's on. In this case, our GPS is our source of uh, navigation, roll information. We have AP on, our yaw damper is on, our altitude select is 8,000 feet, which just turned blue because this is our selected altitude. This will give us an indication of what our current, whoop, we got a little bit too many RPMs there. I'm going to, go ahead and reduce them a little tiny bit here. We have our current altitude here. Again, this is going to be indicated altitude. If we feel the need to reset that, of course, so we can come up here and uh, fits with it anytime we need to make sure that our barometric pressure is set to local. On the right hand side here, this is our vertical speed. Now the top number here is going to be our selected vertical speed. We don't have any because we've just reached our current cruise altitude. Below that, of course, so we have all the other useful information. We have our little inset map. We have our outside temperature. We have, of course, a main, keep in mind, your temperature can be different depending on uh, what's going on. You have the actual speed of the aircraft plus the physical outside temperature. It gets a little complicated. Over here in the center, we have our little navigation display. We can see here that we're facing basically a, yeah, pretty much straight north, which is interesting. It just sort of worked out that way. Over here on the left is our wind display. We have our currently selected heading. If we're interested in changing our currently selected heading, we can come up here and I'll wheel this knob just like this and set it to whatever we want. If we want our heading to agree where we're currently pointing, you can actually push in on this knob and it'll actually center that for us nicely. This is again, will be magnetic heading. This is not true heading. To the right is our selected course. I notice it's about zero degrees. Uh, since we're using the GPS in order to select our course, we cannot control this knob at all. If we were using VOR, we could. To the right, we have our minimums. And remember, this only matters if you've dialed in minimums. This will not appear otherwise. Down here, we have our barometric pressure, which again, you can use this knob to adjust. And of course, we have our current waypoint that we're coming from. And on the right, we have our current waypoint that we're heading to. Below that, if we have a timer running, we'll display here, as well as the UTC, which is going to be, again, our current time. 
another thing you want to keep an eye out for is that we have, just like when we had in the G1000, we have our little pitch tape here, which is going to tell us what angle our aircraft is traveling at. Right now, you can see if this is going to be at zero degrees here. Our nose is pointing right on zero degrees, again, since we're basically cruising at this point. This would indicate a five degree climb. This would indicate a five degree descent. Above that, of course, you have this little piece here, which is going to show you a current roll angle of the aircraft. As this needle points towards it, you increase it. Each one of these is going to be five degrees. As a general rule, you're generally not going to be going more than 30 degrees in a turn. Below that, you've got this little teeny tiny thing here. This is going to be your ball for the purposes of determining if you have any slip. If we go ahead and I'll start kicking my little rudders back and forth, you can see that the aircraft slips. Ideally, this little line is going to be perfectly underneath this triangle. Now, for those of you who are doing any uh, yaw trim, this is a great way to double check to make sure your trim is set correctly on this particular aircraft. Towards the center, we have information as far as our ground speed. We have our desired track. We have our current track. We have our estimated time on route, which is how long it's going to take us to complete this leg. We have our desired bearing. Again, like I said, for one bizarre coincidence, I picked something that was due north. That never happens, I swear. We have our distance remaining. We have anything that if we had a selected altitude for a particular leg, it would be here. And of course, we know exactly what time we expect to get there at that particular position. All right, so that about summarizes everything for the G3000. Uh, the important thing is, uh, if you're going to be using flight plans on this, I usually recommend people set the flight plan up in the regular components in Microsoft Flight Simulator and then start the simulator rather than sitting here and fits with these knobs. There's always the risk you're going to accidentally delete the wrong component of a flight plan. And if you do that, you might find yourself without a flight plan. But other than that, the system's absolutely spectacular. It works really, really, really well. It's really, really smooth. Uh, we don't have a terrain radar built in and we don't have all the charts and everything built in, but we might be seeing that someday and that'd be pretty cool. Enjoy.